Welcome or welcome back at C Square. In this uh, lesson, we'll talk about how to use logic and um, more specific, how to use logic in geometry. So, for example, here we start with what is called inductive reasoning, which is a logical process of reaching a conclusion. And based on this logical process, uh, that follow some patterns, you can have a conjecture, how it's called. So, for example, we have here this pattern of bus arrival times, 9 a.m., 9.30 a.m., 10 a.m. We need to describe the pattern, write a conjecture, in fact, and find the next two terms. So what will be the conjecture based on what we see here on this pattern? I think we can say something like that. Each bus arrival uh, time is 30 minutes from previous bus. Every 30 minutes you have a bus here. So, well, based on this pattern, we can get the next two terms, which are going to be obviously 10.30 a.m. and 10. the next one will be 11 a.m. every 30 minutes. So, Inductive reason, reasoning goes from patterns to a general conclusion. You will see later we're going to talk about deductive reasoning, which is a little bit different. Uh, you can make conjecture using inductive reasoning in geometry. As I said, this, the goal of this lesson is about geometry. So, in this example here, we need to write a conjecture about the relationship of the diagonals of a rhombus. And if you do not know, a rhombus is a quadrilateral. We see it here with all sides congruent and diagonal con connects opposite vertices. But let's draw these di diagonals. So we see here these diagonals of this small rhombus. And look into these diagonals, it seems they are perpendicular, right? I'm going to look to the next rhombus and I'm going to draw the diagonals. Obviously, you can do that with a ruler. A better job than me. And they seem they are perpendicular. And the same thing for the last one. So, what would be the conjecture, the conclusion for this problem using inductive reasoning? We can say, hey, uh, diagonal of a rhombus are perpendicular. Okay. Now, not all conjecture are true. Okay. To show that a conjecture is true, you must prove it. However, you can prove that a conjecture is false by finding one example that shows the conjecture is false. The example that shows the conjecture is false is called a counter example. So let's see this problem I have here. Find a counter example to show that the conjecture is false. So I'm sorry for the double show. So we have this statement here, this conjecture here, and we want to prove is false. Can we find a counter 
counter example and if you think about hey I'm gonna take n you see n has to be greater than 0 I'm gonna make n equals 4 what is square root of 4? square root of 4 is 2 which is less than the number we start so this is not a good counter example and if you go more number like this like n equals 9 okay you may say hey in fact this is a good conjecture right but in fact it's not because let's take a look what's happening if we get n equal 1 square root of 1 right so we're gonna do this square root now of 1 is 1 which is the same of this one n so in this case we we end up with square root of n equals of n for this case of n equals one this is a good counter example counter example to show us that this conjecture is false now we can get another one but you, you can stop here you don't need another one if you can make n equals point um, 25 for example square root of 0.25 is 0.5 which is not less is more than this guy we start from from n so this is a, another good counter example to show that this conjecture we have here is false. Uh, let's take a look to another example where we need to find out, we need in fact to show that the conjecture is false. Again, I double that the show, so I apologize. The conjecture we have here, if two angles are congruent, then they are vertical angles, right? So is this conjecture true? Is this conjecture false? If we found a counter example, then we prove very fast the conjecture is false. But let's take a look. I have this line here. And I'm going to draw a perpendicular on this line. Obviously, I can form two angles, and I said this is perpendicular, right? And each angle here is 90 degrees. And you notice these two angles are not vertical angles. Remember, vertical angles are a little bit different. They are adjacent angle. They form a line. They are not vertical angles, but they are still congruent. Okay, so this is a good counter example to show that this conjecture is false. We have two angles that are congruent and they are not vertical angles. Uh, I already mentioned the word statement in my uh, first part of the lesson. A statement is a sentence, and this sentence can be either true or false. Um, you can put more statements together, and you, we call them compound statements. And the true value of a statement, like I said, is either true or false. And usually we, we use letter to represent statements. In geometry, you have some statements that are very important if and then statements those are called conditional statements the first part the one that you have if in it is called the hypotenuse hypothesis and the part after the then the word then is called conclusion sometimes you may not see that then you can still uh, have a conditional statement and Look at here, this is the symbolic way to present a conditional statement. If P, P then Q, that's the way we read this. So, 
Let's take a look to an example here. Identify the hypothesis and conclusion of the conditional statement. And let's take a look to A. If the number is even, you see, this part here is the hypothesis. This is P. Then the number is divisible by 2. This is the conclusion. If P, then Q. Let's take a look to part B. Okay, very, very similar. We see if angle A and B are complementary. So this can be P. It is P in, a, in fact. Then the measure of angle A plus the measure of angle B. This is the Q, the conclusion. And the first part, the hypothesis, the, the sum of the measure of the angles is 90 degree. A conditional statement can be true or false. And to show that a conditional statement is true, you show that every time the hypothesis is true, the conclusion is true. However, if you want to show that a conditional statement is false, you need to find a counter example. Another thing that is important is what we call in logic statements is negation. Whenever you negate a statement, um, that's the way to mark it one way. And it's red, not P. So for instance, we have here the car is red, the original statement. The negation is the car is not red. We negate it and you see the symbols. Every, three, every conditional statement has three related conditional statements. What do we mean by that? Look at here to this example I have. This is the conditional given to us. If segment AB congruent to segment CD, then the measure of segment AB is equal to the measure of CD. So this is if P, then Q. Another conditional statement related to the one we have, it's called the converse. And you notice in this case, we switch. This guy came here, this guy came here. Switch. If the measure of segment AB equals the measure of segment CD, then segment, then the segment AB congruent of segment CD. This is when we switch, and it's called the converse. Let's take a look to the next one, which is called the inverse. Let's take a look. What does it say the inverse? If segment AB is not congruent, that's the meaning of this guy. So he's negating the hypothesis here. So if segment AB is not congruent to segment CD, then the measure of segment AB is not equal. That's the meaning of this sign of segment, the measure of segment CD. So you notice these two guys are negations of the, my original statement, the hypothesis and the conclusion are negated. This is called the inverse. And the last one is the contrapositive. And let's take a look here. This is a negation. Oops, and here I should have P, my fault. Okay, a negation of the converse. Let's take a look. If segment, the measure of segment AB is not equal to the measure of the segment CD, then the segment AB is not congruent to the segment CD. Okay, so the segment AB is not congruent to segment CD. Okay, these are the uh, three related conditional statements. And um, very important, a conditional and its contrapositive are equivalent. These two guys are equivalent statement. And these two are equivalent statement. You'll see that in my next examples. So write the converse inverse and the contrapositive of the following conditional statement. Identify the true value of each. If the statement is false, give a counterexample. So let's start to A. Okay, so we notice if you are a pianist, 
then you are a musician. If P, then Q. I'm going to go with the converse. Okay, if you remember the converse, we just switch them. So let's take a look how we switch them. If you are a mu musician. Then you are a pianist. This will be the converse, which is, if you remember, Q, then P. This original one was P, then Q. Now, Let's take a look a little bit. This is a true statement. I think we can see that. If you are a pianist, then you are a musician. This one is not necessarily true. It's because uh, if you are a musician, you don't need necessarily to be a pianist. You can be something else. You name it. So this is false. Now, let's go to the next one. The inverse. If you remember the inverse... What do we have to do with the inverse of the original conditional statement? We negate the P and Q. If you are not Pianist, then you are not a musician. Okay, so you notice this is the non P then non-Q. Is this a true statement? I, it is false. Why this is false? If you are not a pianist, then you are not a musician. You can be anything else in, in the, and you can be a musician. Like a, you play guitar, you still are a musician, right? So this, we found a contra example to prove that is false. Now, let's take a look to the last one. If you remember, the last one is called the contrapositive. How does it sound in our case, the contrapositive? Okay, we, if you are not a musician, then you are not a pianist. So this will be what? This is non Q, then non P. And this is a true statement. So you notice now in my example here, the original conditional statement and the contra positive, they have the same true value. While the converse and the inverse have the same true value. Uh, let's go to part B. If a figure is a rectangle, then it has four sides. That is the original statement. Let's write the converse. Okay, uh, which is uh, if a figure
has four sides then it is a rectangle Okay, so the first one is true, by the way, the conditional statement here, if a figure is a rectangle, then it has four sides. But let's take a look to the converse. If a figure has four sides, then it's, it is a rectangle. Not necessary. We can, we can have some other four sides figures that are not rectangles, like a rhombus, like a parallelogram. So this is false. Let's take a look to the inverse. So the inverse we are going to negate. If you are not a rectangle, if, I'm sorry, if a figure is not a rectangle, no, I'm sorry, if a figure yeah, is not a rectangle, then it does not have four sides. All right? If a figure is not a rectangle, th then it does not have four sides. But we have a figure that has uh, four sides and is not a rectangle. I just mentioned that parallelogram. Okay, so you notice this one is false. Let's go to the last one, the contra positive. What did that statement? If a figure does not have four sides does not have four sides then it is not a rectangle. Which is a true statement. So again, you notice these two are true, these two are false. Okay, they are equivalent statement. Okay, so now a biconditional statement. That is a very, very important statement in geometry, and not only a biconditional statement. Combine these two statements, conditional and its converse. Let's see an example from the algebra. And the conditional is if two lines are parallel, then the lines have the same slope. The converse, you notice, we switch. If two lines have the same slope, then the lines are parallel. These two, if you remember a bit from the algebra, are both true. So we can combine them and get what is called a biconditional. Two lines are parallel. This is the way we do it. If and only if the lines have the same slope. So we can combine these two guys in a biconditional, how it's called. And this is the key thing, and you're going to see that, especially in geometry. This is the notation, and it means P imply Q, if P then Q, and also if Q then P. Okay, that's the meaning of that double arrow. 
you can write conditional statement if and only if you can see I use it that here the conditional and its converse are true they have to be both true in order to go from uh, two statements to one other than that you cannot do it so let's take a look here write the conditional statement the converse for each statement and determine the true value false find the contrary example write the by conditional statement if possible so we have this statement here and we want to write the conditional which is if two the sum of complementary angles if two angles so I, I, I guess this is one way if two angles are complementary then the sum of the measure of those angle of these angles is 90 degree Okay, this is the conditional statement based on this given statement. Let's write the converse. The converse, we're going to switch them. If the sum of the measure of two angles is 90 degree then these angles are complementary Okay, so you can see now uh, both statements, the conditional and, the, and its converse. Are these two statements true? Yeah, both of them are true. So now we can write what is called the biconditional, which sounds something like that. Um, two angles are complementary. if and only if the sum of the measures of these angles is 90 degree so you notice this one combined these two guys which are true statement and this would be also true other than that uh, you cannot write it okay next part of the lesson let's take a look to deductive reasoning we talk about inductive which goes from pattern to general this one goes from general facts rules definition or property i said here to a specific valid conclusion from the given statement. So let's take a look to this example, determine whether each conclusion is based on inductive or deductive reasoning. If a student turns the homework late, then the student is penalized 10% of the homework grade. You turn your homework late, so you conclude that you will be penalized 10% penalized of your homework grade. Is this inductive or deductive? This is deductive why this is deductive you go from a general rule 
to a specific case to you apply the rule to a specific case so that is deductive reasoning let's take a look to part b a teacher notice that john is late every class the teacher concludes that the job that john will be late for next class it, this one on the other hand is an inductive reasoning why you going from patterns right you see that that student is late every class so that means you go from patterns and you go to make a general statement you go from a pattern specific case to general so maybe here i should say you go to a pattern so kind of opposite things deductive and inductive reasoning be sure you understand which one you use when you use very important in logic is our information that are given you'll see them uh, in my next part of the lesson this information are true you don't have to prove them true they are true on the other hand the conclusion that you want to prove you cannot assume to be true you have to follow some steps to prove that conclusion and those steps that's those step this the uh, if uh, it's called an argument argument and i said here an argument consists of reason proofs or evidence to support a position in I'm going to have two laws here that are used most of the time in geometry. The law of detachment and the law of syllogism. Can you see them here? The law of detachment. Look at here. If P then Q is true, we know given it's always true. And P is true, then the conclusion is true. Q is true. Okay, so if you see this pattern, by, you don't have to do anything. You know the conclusion will be true. Law of syllogism. If P then Q is true and Q then R is true, if this is true, we know it's true, then the conclusion is P then R is true. So in other words, you see how you kind of a transitive property if that helps. Okay, so let's see how we use this property, these laws here to um determine if a conclusion is valid okay so let's take a look to part a if you turn in your homework then you receive full credit so what do we have here if you turn the homework you receive credit full credit let's do like that so i use h then f now let's go to the next thing you turn in your homework this is the second statement which says h is true based on law of detachment the conclusion which says you get full credit is true also so that the law of detachment says if this is true which we know is true this is true then the um, conclusion is also true let's take a look to part b which we can break it in a very similar way let's see if this is a valid statement so i will say here valid Let's, and this one says if a triangle has a base of 4 cm and a height of 3 cm so we know that the height and the base I'm going to call them like that are 4 and 3 then the area is 6 square cm so we know that statement and then this next statement says triangle ABC has an area of 6 cm. So now we know A is true. Now you need to be careful because in this case you cannot assume that 
this conclusion, the base of the triangle is 4 and the height of the triangle is 3. You cannot assume HB is true. No, you cannot assume that. Why not? Because you see it doesn't follow the law of detachment. This is the conclusion. Here it was the hypothesis you notice hypothesis and here it was the conclusion. So it's switch. So this is not valid. And also you can find the contra example here to prove that this conclusion is not true. I can have a triangle that has a, a base of one centimeter, a height of 12, we still get an area of 6. Okay, so you see we have proved that this conclusion is not valid. Okay, and uh, very, very similar for law of syllogism in this slide. Uh, if you come to school, then you pass your class. Okay, so you come to school, pass the class. If you pass your classes, then you graduate your sc the school. You pass the classes, you graduate. Then is this conclusion, if you come to school, then you graduate? The answer is yes, it is, because it follows the law of syllogism. You notice, let me say that, you notice these two P's here, then we can pair these two guys, like a transitive property. So this is a valid argument. Let's take a look to part B. Given if a line bisect an angle, then the line cut the angle in two congruent angles. So if a line bisect, I'm going to use a B in this case, an angle, then it cut the angles in congruent angles. There you go. If B, then C. If the line cut the angle into congruent angles, C, then the line is an angle bisector, A. So what would be this, if we use the law of uh, syllogism here, we'll, we'll say right away B, then A. Let's see if that is the conclusion. If a line bisects an angle, then the line is angle bisector. Yeah, this is a valid argument. Okay. Uh, you can use these two laws together to make conclusion. Yes, sometimes in geometry and in other logic problem, you will have to use more than one uh, logic uh, statement uh, to prove what you need to prove. So let's take a look here. If you live in Jacksonville, then you live in Florida. If you live in Jacksonville, then you live in Florida. If you live in Florida, then you live in United States. So based on these two conditional statements, we can say this. If you live in Jacksonville, then you live in United States. This is the law of syllogisms. If you live in Jacksonville, then you live in United States. And you see these two F's here. But now let's take a look to the next thing. This says, you live in Jacksonville. Okay, so you live in Jacksonville. So this is true. That's what he says. Can the conclusion, which is right here, you live in the United States, be true? Yeah. Why? Because it follows the law of detachment. So the first part 
was the law of syllogism. Let me be sure I spell it right. So in the first part we we'll use law of C law gism. In this last part here I use the law of detachment. I use these two laws together in this example to make a conclusion. That's it for today. Thank you. If you enjoyed the lesson, don't forget to click the like button and come back on C-Square for more help.